A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today for this uh, Independence Day Eve edition of Cam and Company. We're going to be talking about what uh, happened to the Supreme Court yesterday, the orders from conference. Not disposing of, but I guess dealing with uh, a baker's dozen of uh, Second Amendment related cases. We'll uh, get to our conversation with Chuck Michelle, head of the California Rifle and Pistol Association and the co-founder of the 2A Law Center. Uh, his take on the Supreme Court's moves in just one moment. Before we do, though, let's talk about this. Economists warn that massive tax hikes could devastate your IRA and 401k account as the stock market braces for impact. With inflation on the rise, global uncertainty looming, it is clear why central banks and savvy Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't had your eye on gold, time to make it a priority. Priority Gold. Trust their team of proven professionals to help you diversify your savings with gold and silver. Call 1-800-405-GOLD or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden for a free gold info guide. Plus, see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Experts agree that physical gold is one of the best ways to fortify your savings, no matter the economic climate. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market's golden. Call 1-800-405-GOLD to speak with a gold specialist or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden to learn more, that's 1-800-405-GOLD. This was not a uh, gold-level decision by the Supreme Court yesterday uh, in dealing with these Second Amendment cases. It could have been worse, as uh, Chuck Michelle says, but uh, it also could have been so much better than the punt that we saw from the uh, High Court on Tuesday. Take a look and a listen. Chuck, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's good to see you, sir. Always a pleasure, Cam. Thanks for having me. You bet. So um, this is airing on Wednesday, but we're talking on Tuesday afternoon, just a couple of hours after the uh, wrap-up conference orders were released. I'm I'm frustrated, Chuck. How are you feeling about uh, what the court did with these cases today? Well, it could have been worse. Uh, uh, They did not close the door completely on any case, including the Illinois uh, semi-auto and magazine capacity uh, law. Uh, those they just basically said we don't want to take that yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so go ahead and finish your trial. And they and this case is in trial in the Southern District of Illinois. There's a trial date in September. We've been actively putting together witness lists, exhibit expert lists, uh, doing discovery. You know the information exchange with the state. Judge McGlynn is pushing this case along as fast as he can. Uh, he wisely, it now turns out, declined to let the parties stay the case to, until we saw what the Supreme Court did. So it's been moving along but the, the whole time. Uh, now, oh, I, I think we're going to win in this in the district court in front of Judge McGlynn again. Mm-hmm. And that's going to go up to the Seventh Circuit again. And there are some there is some language in the uh, uh, statements from Judge uh, um Alito and Thomas, where they say the Seventh Circuit opinion, the the existing Seventh Circuit opinion is dumb. Unmoored Uh, from uh, text and history, I believe, was the phrase that Justice Thomas used, right? He he puts it such more so much more eloquently than me. You know, (laughs) to me, I hear these things. I'm like, that's stupid. He said that's unmoored. I'm going to have to I may have to try and incorporate that into my vocabulary. Right. Uh, no. You are unmoored in your uh, opinion, sir. Uh, yeah, and and Justice Thomas's statement was was great. I mean, it was fantastic. I just wish that it had accompanied a uh, a, a grant of certiorari. But as you and I talked the last time we were on the program, you kind of thought this might be the outcome, given how close we are to going to trial in Illinois. Yeah. They they know that judge. You know, they can look at the the docket for the trial court in Illinois with Judge McGlynn, and they can see how fast it's moving along. They can see his orders. I mean, his, you know, his orders are basically telegraphing what's happening. They talk about how fast he wants things to go. Yeah. So that that's, that's not, it's not as good as it could be, but it's not bad news either. It's not, not uh, you're done. It's a come on back later. Right. Well, and that's, I mean, and that's essentially what they said with all of these cases, right? The ones that they GVR'd, um, it, it, that's essentially saying come back later too. Were you surprised? Well, yeah, that, but okay, yeah, okay. Go. Well, I was gonna say, were you surprised that they GVR'd all of these primitive persons cases, including like Garland versus Range? They said, you know, to the Third Circuit, go back and look at this in light of what we said in Rahimi. Well, 
okay, so range is about a guy who's a nonviolent offender, right? It was a nonviolent yeah. crime of, of falsifying uh, income on a food stamp application. It was not a temporary disarming of Brian Range. He was permanently prohibited from owning a firearm. And this and the Third Circuit said, listen, this violates his Second Amendment rights. I'm curious, what is there for the Third Circuit to go back and take a look at in light of Rahimi in the Range case? Uh, that's a good question, because, you know, they don't they generally don't vacate the lower court opinion, opinion that's right. Yeah. But 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 what the Third Circuit's going to do is just I mean, Rahimi says all Rahimi says is that you can temporarily ban a dangerous person who's been given due process and found to be dangerous, dangerous uh, as an individual. Doesn't say anything about banning all felons, all nonviolent felons, all cannabis users. Doesn't say anything about banning classes. Just non-violent non, uh, uh, and dangerous individuals. So I think they may rewrite their reasoning a little bit uh, and probably use some of that language from Rahimi that says if it's a dangerous individual, blah, 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 uh, then you can disarm them. But this guy is not. And so we were, we're right and, and we stand by our opinion. I and mean, then they can do that. Uh, I think maybe the court just wanted to buy some time on range uh, and, and so punted it back there. Uh, but they did it, you know, there was a whole bunch of, it was probably a half a dozen or more. Uh, anyway, they, they didn't have lawyers. Okay. And so they, they are, uh, they're, all their cases were vacated and remanded too. So there's all these people now who are going to uh, be, ha have to revisit those, all those, uh, that collection of opinions about prohibited people. So that's not particularly surprising. You know, the Solicitor General has asked the court to take a, a couple of, of, like a few felon in possession cases. They want mm -hmm. to classify them as drug users, drug sellers, violent felons, nonviolent felons, and have the Supreme Court straighten out who can and who cannot be uh, prohibited from possessing firearms without it violating the Second Amendment in, in those different classifications. They're probably going to take that for next year for the next court session beginning the first Monday in October. Uh, and, and so we'll get, a. I think we're going to get a lot, we're about to get a big dump of uh, law on prohibited people. The thing that intrigued me the most and frankly confuses me a bit is that they GVR'd Antonia. The, this is the New York case asking uh, two questions, right? First, what is the more appropriate time period to look at, 1791 or 1868? And then the second question, and maybe the most important question, is whether or not New York is violating the law by imposing this good moral character test on concealed carry applicants, right? And the Supreme Court, again, they GVR'd this case. They said, uh, you know, go back and look at this in light of what we said in Rahimi. Well, what does Rahimi say that would inform Antonyuk? Well, unless it says you can only disarm people who are violent, had due process, and temporarily, it, I don't know that it changes anything. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, they're, again, they're looking for sort of the reasoning to be re-characterized. Right. And uh, and then they'll, those cases will be back up there, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I guess my one of my frustrations is that we saw in Rahimi Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, I believe even uh, Justice Barrett, uh, and certainly uh, Justice uh, Thomas, all kind of talked about it. Hey, look, you know, we we haven't decided all of these other questions, right? There are a lot of outstanding questions. Just as Kavanaugh said, you know, it's the early innings of the ball game, basically, when it comes to Second Amendment jurisprudence. And rather than take the opportunity to answer those questions, they just kind of kicked them back down to the lower courts and said, "You guys deal with it. We'll 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 we'll, we'll pick it up when you uh, when when these cases get back before us." I, I mean, on the one hand, the courts admitting, yes, there's a whole lot of questions that are unanswered. But they're not taking the opportunity to answer those questions right away. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So and, the next and, and it seems like they're presuming that some of those questions were answered in Rahimi. And I, I'm, I'm not sure they really were. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, all right. So the next question I've got for you, it, we, we know what's going on with the Illinois cases. They're going to trial hopefully in September. Um, what are the next cases that could come up before the Supreme Court dealing with gun and magazine bans? I wrote a piece at Bearing Arms uh, on Tuesday talking about Duncan. Uh, right. Oral arguments were held back in March in the Ninth Circuit on Bonk in Duncan. Bonk. That's the magazine ban case. And then the Fourth Circuit held oral arguments on Bonk in uh, uh, Bianchi, which is Maryland's gun ban challenge. So are, are, are those sort of now, you know, uh, uh, leapfrog some of these other cases? Are they the ones that are the most likely to, to get to yeah, the court first? Those cases are now in the poll position. Those cases will be if if Duncan says that magazines are not bearable arms, so they're not arms covered by the Second Amendment, that's a case that I think the Second Amendment, I mean, the Supreme Court is going to want to take. So yeah, we'll be in front of the Supreme Court on Duncan next next year, okay. uh, unless unless the you know the Ninth Circuit is in turmoil between the conservative and the liberal justices, right? I mean, they, they just had a, a, a three judge, or actually it was on Bonk, on Tedder. And, and uh, you know, because Hawaii tried to repeal their butterfly knife uh, law to moot that case. And the conservative justices were just tearing them apart. So it's a question of, out of 11, can you get seven judges? Mm -hmm. So... We're going to see what happens there, and if we change too much, remember last time we lost seven to four in Duncan, because this is the second time around for Duncan to be going coming up through on bond, right? And it will be the second time to the Supreme Court too, because last time, Dunk, uh, Supreme Court GVR Duncan. So uh, uh, if if two of those judges, even if they're not quite hardcore left, change their mind and we win, you know, six to five in, in the en banc panel, I mean, that could happen. I mean, I'm probably being, I'm, it's probably a bit of wishful thinking, but, it, it, you know, it because I'm giving too much credit to two judges to actually be faithful to Bruin and Rahimi and Heller. But, it, it, you know, so we'll see. But, yes, Duncan and Bianchi are now in the poll position to go to the Supreme Court next. Okay. Soonest. But, again, but, there's there's no deadline for the court to issue its decision, right? It can hold on to these cases for months if months. it wanted to. Yes. Okay. Uh, but but they're still, I'm sure they're going to be coming out before, like, even Illinois will win it, assuming we win at trial, it'll go up to the Seventh Circuit. The Seventh Circuit will have briefing and oral argument, and then they'll sit on it. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Duncan and Bianchi will be first. Okay. Um, which which I guess gets back to the, uh, the point that the Supreme Court can only kick these cans down the road for so long, right? I mean, they, they keep you know, say, well, this, it's an interlocutory appeal. It's too early. Well, we're going to GBR these other cases. At some point, they're going to get a case that will have been fully briefed, that will have been fully decided, and it's going to deal with these very, very critical questions. And then the Supreme Court's going to be left with that decision of do we grant cert or do we just let those lower court decisions stand? Right. Yep. Do you, are, are, are you getting are you getting anxious? OK, I was that was going to be my next question. Are you getting anxious at all that they're going to let these lower court decisions stand if they're bad decisions? No, I mean. Yes, statistically, Supreme Court hardly ever takes any cases, but right. Recognize everything that the justices are saying, even in Rahimi, they're saying that this is a new area of the law. We really need to give people some guidance, even though even the. Uh, Liberal judges on the Supreme Court are saying we need to give the lower courts some guidance. Yeah, is the, so, I mean, it's what like kind of guidance, guidance they want to yeah. give, right? <laughs> yeah, right. But oh. uh, I, I think the Supreme Court knows that it just can't let stuff flounder like this, where judges are making stuff up and you know running through every gray area of uh, of uh, Heller, Bruin, and Rahimi to the extent. They are gray areas in the first place. I don't really think they are, but the other side has managed to paint them that way. So uh, Supreme Court's going to have to weigh in. And yeah. So I think next year, I think next session is going to be a busy Second Amendment se session for the Supreme Court. 
starting in October when they uh, when they come back and start graining cases. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we may get a ruling in Duncan, you know, over the summer. We'll, we'll get some rulings, and we'll be right in there in the beginning of October. I say, boy. From your mouth to the appellate court's ears, I uh, I hope indeed that, that is the case. Uh, listen, and we do have the Vanderstock case, right? So we do have the uh, frame and receiver rule that the Supreme Court has already granted. So that will be heard this fall, right? Yeah, but that's another that's APA another, case, right? Yeah, but in light of the Chevron, the ruling in Loper uh, on Chevron deference, that kind of changes the game there, too. It it does yes, but it is not is not a pure Second Amendment case. Um, I, I I do suspect that uh, that rule is in trouble, but uh, not on Second Amendment grounds. All right, well, so so you feel okay? It sounds like uh, you're you're not you're not getting rid yeah, of those. The only, the only thing that's going to really make me a pessimist is if Joe Biden wins and stacks the court. Or whoever Joe Biden. Was, <laughs> I'm glad that you offered that caveat. Yeah. Because by the time this airs on uh, Wednesday, who knows what the uh, what the story will be? Although I think they're going to wait at least a couple more days before they uh, cut bait, if they do cut bait. All right, Chuck. Listen, I appreciate your update and your insight. Um, thank you for making me a little bit less frustrated with uh, with the Supreme Court and its inaction here. I guess not inaction, not the action I wanted no, no, them to GBRs take. GBRs are a big thing. GBRs yeah. are so. I I know, I know. They could have just dismissed them. I know, but they were been holding on for so summary, long. They should, could have done a summary reversal. They could have said, "We're not going to go through these briefs and this oral argument. You're just wrong, and here's why, and you're overruled." You know. Okay. But that's even rarer than a GDR. So. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I do appreciate you carving out a couple minutes, and uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking again very soon. Uh, if folks want to keep up with everything that's going on in, in California, crpa.org, right? That's the website. Thank you. Yes. And uh, 2A Law Center, 2ALC.org for uh, all of the work that uh, Chuck and Steve Hallbrook and the folks at 2A Law Center are doing on the Illinois cases uh, and elsewhere. Uh, Chuck, again, thanks for your time. Thanks for all you do. And I look forward to doing this again very soon. Cam, thanks for helping to get the word out, man. It's very important that people stay informed and you're a big part of them uh, uh, staying informed. So thank you. Thank you. My thanks to Chuck for joining us on the program. I was looking forward to having him back again here very soon. And, you know, listen, litigation is still going to continue, even though the Supreme Court is sort of keeping these cases in a holding pattern, right? We just saw Firearms Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, California Rifle and Pistol Association, and the NRA all team up, which is interesting to see all four of those groups uh, getting involved in a lawsuit to take on California's new 11% excise tax on firearms and ammunition. Now, they are challenging that out in federal court, but in uh, California state court. Uh, but we again, we're going to see more federal lawsuits filed as well. It, it is just, you know, you, you can't you can't sit on your laurels, right? You can't sit on your hands. Uh, but it would be great if we saw a sign from the Supreme Court that, um, that they were not so reluctant to address some of these cases, given the fact that people's rights are being infringed every day while these laws remain in place. All right, before we get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, let's talk about this for a second. At the very heart of our democracy lies the principle that we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives, leaving many folks feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where Wealth Protection Research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth Protection Research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth Protection Research seeks out financial experts, particularly the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. That's why Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report that highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and you can get it absolutely free. Just text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 Election Protection Report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, and to take control of your financial destiny. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. All right. In today's recidivist report, 
We will uh, turn our attention to North Carolina, where a uh, individual who is suspected of uh, ramming a stolen car into a gun shop back in February has received probation for possessing a firearm that was stolen from that gun shop back in February. That's right. Uh, Reginald Moses is still facing charges in connection with the break-in of the gun store, so it is possible that he and his co-defendants will eventually receive some time behind bars, but that's not what happened after uh, Moses was caught with a gun that had been taken from uh, Carolina Sporting Arms back in February. Uh, Instead, he received 12 months of probation in Cabarrus County after he was charged with possession of a stolen firearm. This is a Class H felony under North Carolina law. It is punishable by up to 39 months in state prison. Again, uh, Mr. Moses, already facing other charges in Mecklenburg County related to the break-in. He was also charged with murder and attempted robbery in Mecklenburg County last year, although prosecutors dropped those charges after six months, citing insufficient evidence. Uh, This is an individual who is at least known uh, to law enforcement. They had the opportunity to send a message in the court system, and they did. <laughs> they sent the message that it's not really that serious an offense to be walking around with a stolen firearm. That's the message that was sent here. Uh, and instead of going to prison for the next couple of years, Reginald Moses is still out on the street. Just has to check in with his probation officer, at least until the uh, burglary case goes to trial in Mecklenburg County. If, I should say if, That case goes to trial and doesn't result in yet another sweetheart plea deal. All right. uh, Today's uh, armed citizen story, also from North Carolina, a little bit uh, north of Charlotte, High Point, North Carolina, where a uh, suspect was shot during an attempted home burglary in High Point. Makes this interesting. There were three individuals from South Carolina who were arrested and charged with committing this burglary. Now, a High Point is in the northern part of the state. It's about three hours south of where I live. It's you know, not too far from the uh, Rally Durham, Wake Forest area. Uh, Dillon, South Carolina is quite a ways away. Police haven't said if this home was targeted specifically or why these individuals from Dillon, South Carolina were there in High Point, what made them pick this home. But uh, this may not have been a uh, random break in attempt. It was about uh, almost three o'clock Monday morning. Officers responded to a residential break and entering call. People at the home said that somebody tried to open the front door and then busted a window in the rear of the home in order to get inside. That's when one of the residents grabbed a handgun, fired at the suspect who ran off. Short time later, officers were told that there was a person with a gunshot wound who had shown up at the local hospital. A person listed in serious condition when they arrived. Detectives right now have charged uh, 25-year-old Aaron Barr of Dillon, South Carolina, 27-year-old Jaconti Bathia of Fort Mill, South Carolina, and Jameer Jones of uh, 22 of uh, Dillon, South Carolina, with first-degree burglary, felony conspiracy, and felony accessory after the fact. They say additional charges could be filed. Again, they haven't said anything about a motive, but uh, it is strange. I mean, you think there's, there's just a random break-in that uh, there would be plenty of homes there in the Dillon, South Carolina area rather than these individuals uh, hopping in their car and driving up the road to uh, High Point, North Carolina. Keep our eyes on this story, see if there's any more information that becomes available in the next few days. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing able to do the right thing. A couple of strangers who came to the aid of James Webb. Uh, Mr. Webb lives in the Oxford, well, lived in the Oxford Manor Apartments in uh, Southeast Washington, D.C. Last Tuesday, His apartment complex caught on fire. According to authorities, there were some kids that were playing with uh, Roman candles. Apparently, uh, one of the uh, Roman candles uh, that was, uh, you know, being used ended up catching a second story balcony on fire. And then the flames leapt up into the attic and the roof. Then there was another building that caught on fire. Uh, 76 people. 76 people forced out of their homes, lost their belongings, according to NBC Washington. And one of them was James Webb, 73 years old. But Mr. Webb could have lost his life were it not for these strangers who came pounding on his door telling him, you got to get out of here. Webb says at that point, there was a smoke that had already been pouring into his lungs. Mr. Webb, 73, I said, he's got uh, COPD, his other health problems, also legally blind. So it wasn't easy. I mean, he knew that something was wrong, but it wasn't easy for him to get out. 
But he said when he heard that knock, he said, uh, these strangers said, you got to get out of here. They tried to pull me and I'm holding on to things. He said he was able to grab a couple of photos of his late wife and their kids before he left. But again, now everything that he had, save for what he was able to take with him, is basically lost. Webb ended up in the hospital. Um, after he was released, he needed to replace medication that cost $200, uh, even with his insurance. He said the apartment complex managers arranged for him to stay in a motel uh, and then offered him a vacant apartment in another complex managed by the same company, which is nice. But again, <laughs> I hope that those juveniles who were uh, responsible for this fire, hope that they end up facing some charges. I mean, this is Mr. Webb's home for the past 30 years. Um, he said that uh, everything's really uh, unusable. He says there's smoke damage, there's water damage, the ceiling came down in his old place. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's so disturbing that uh, this happened. Thankfully, again, because of those two strangers, who knocked on Mr. Webb's door. He is alive today, but man, I really hope that there's some consequences for the uh, teens who started this blaze and again, displaced dozens of families in the DC area. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the program. All right. So here's the deal. Uh, tomorrow, Independence Day, we will be off. So no Cam and Company. We don't normally do a Cam and Company on Friday, so no Cam and Company on Friday. And then I will be off on Monday. Uh, Miss E uh, is going back on chemotherapy and immunotherapy on Friday. And we expect that it's going to be, unfortunately, kind of a um, uh, a rough start. They're, they're, the immunotherapy drugs haven't hit her quite as hard as the chemo drugs have in the past. So um, I'm going to take Monday off just in case she needs me. But uh, I'll be back on Tuesday of next week. Uh, in the meantime, be sure to check out BarryAndArms.com. Tom Knighton will be holding down the fort. I'll be writing on Friday and over the weekend uh, as much as I can over the weekend, <laughs> um, given that Friday is the first day that uh, she's getting her treatment. That that might be – we'll see what the weekend schedule is like. But we will have a full posting schedule uh, over the weekend at Barry and Arms. We are going to take tomorrow off, so the uh, schedule will be pretty light on Independence Day. But we'll be back at it on Friday. And again, Barry and Arms Cam and Company will return next Tuesday. And until then, be well, be safe, and be free. And become a VIP or VIP gold member. Just use the promo code SAVEAMERICA when you go to BarryAndArms.com. You can get 50% off your VIP membership. That is a significant saving. You'll get uh, an ad-free experience. You'll get exclusive content. And you report the independent pro segment of journalism that we're doing at Barry and Arms. And we thank you very much for that because in this day and age of big tech censorship, and rampant anti-gun media bias, it is so important to get a pro segment of perspective out there, and your VIP membership allows that to happen. So thank you again. Have a happy Independence Day. Hope you have a, a great time. Like I said, be safe, but uh, be well. And most importantly, celebrate being free. We'll see you back here soon. <laughs>